Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rohit Gosain and with my brother and co-host Rahul Gosain. We are practicing medical oncologists out in the community and our goal here is to keep our fellow community oncologists up to date in this ever-evolving field of oncology. With that in mind, we are diving into the world of renal cell carcinoma, RCC, and we couldn't be more excited to have Dr. Katie Beckerman, the Medical Chief Director of Cancer Research at the Tennessee Oncology with us today. Katie, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and chat with you both. It's great to have you, Katie. I'm eagerly looking forward to hearing your thoughts on what's working in RCC, and importantly, how can we sequence our available options to do the best for our patients? We'll start off with early stage disease, touching on the adjuvant space and then switching gears to metastatic space, as we've seen a few updates and approvals here. Katie, can you touch on your treatment paradigm here in early disease, as we now have pembrolizumab available based off Keynote 564 study after surgery? Yeah, over the last year, we've seen the initial reporting for pembro in the adjuvant space for a DFS benefit, and then it also came out and reported an OS benefit, which really solidified the benefit for our patients. In the adjuvant space, we know we have the most data, actually the only data for patients who have clear cells. The trial included patients who had T2 disease if they had grade three or four. But what, what we basically see is that the more aggressive disease, the more likely the patient was you know, to benefit. Based on that, I will often use a, a kind of risk of recurrence, talk to them about the potential side effects, which unfortunately can be lifelong from pembrolizumab and try to have that personalized decision with the patient sitting in front of me. Most of the time I'm offering this to patients who have stage three disease, higher risk, maybe IVC thrombus, for sure, conversations with patients who have lymph node involvement or that are M1 NED. We know from the metastatic setting, patients in RCC who have so much weight features tend to have more of an enrichment. And so if I see that on the path, then that also kind of gives me the inclination. To offer. Katie, any role of pd one testing in this setting? You know, we just haven't gotten that to work at RCC. There's maybe a hint that it helps to enrich. But we still have so many patients who ultimately will have a response and be PDL1 negative. So currently, if you think kidney cancer, you do not have to think about PDL1 testing. And I think we've uh, harped this on based on multiple studies. Uh, PDL1, again, is not the best marker, but we'll see how some studies play out. I want to reiterate some of the things that you mentioned, Katie, with regards to the Keynote 564, based off which pembrolizumab in adjuvant setting was approved, was P2 with high-grade or sarcomacoid features, T3, T4, or no positive disease. As a result, this is now the standard of care for this intermediate or high-risk patient population. Katie, before we move on into metastatic space, in terms of surveillance scans, what is your go-to modality, and when do you rely on bone imaging, if at all, in early stage? When I'm doing surveillance scans, I closely align with the NCCN guidelines. Often the type of scan I'll use is dependent upon, because some of these patients may have CKD, either post-nephrectomy or due to other comorbidities. If I'm not able to get good imaging modality because of knee function with a CT with contrast, then I'll often go to an MRI. As far as the, the bone scans, per NCCN guidelines, it's not, not a recommended unless the patient is symptomatic. When a patient comes in with any sort of symptomatic complaint, get that. Yeah. I promise we'll move on to metastatic space after this, but are you using CTDNA here or at all in RCC outside clinical? Um, I'm not yet. I'm really excited for it. And I think at GU ASCO this year and at several of the other conferences, we're seeing some really exciting developments. It's just been that in kidney cancer, it's not been a high shedding tumor, like, for example, where I'm able to use it more predictably with urocelial carcinoma. In my experience, kidney cancer can just kind of have false negative. And I, I think also that there's going to be newer technologies that maybe give us better readouts. So I hope more more CTDNA or hypermethylation or other other ways to do non-invasive testing, you know, coming we're okay, now on to metastatic RCC. We have a few options here. Dual checkpoint inhibitors, TKI with IO, single agent IO. What is your judgment? Katie, before you start off, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but before we dive into the de novo metastatic space, what if a patient has been 
Ron Pembroke now has progressive disease, or disease has recurred shortly after immunotherapy has subsided. Can we start there, please? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really important question that these patients are uh, unfortunately starting. We're starting to see these patients in practice. First of all, I think this is a data free zone where we haven't designed yet a clinical trial that will exactly answer this. I get my data from two sources. One is us understanding how long the immunotherapy kind of can bind and block T cell or that CD1 engagement. The other context is from some of our studies in refractory RCC setting such as Contact 03 and Tnevo. For example, they've been on pembrolizumab for six months. You feel like they've been on it for a period of time that they would have seen the benefit from it, and then they start to progress. Then I switch mechanisms of action because in that setting, based on Contact 03 and Tnevo, we have not seen a benefit to adding or switching agents there. The patient hasn't really been on IO, but, you know, the, the first three months, and or maybe there were small nodules to start and, and minimal growth. I might give them the benefit of the doubt and add in probably a TKI at that point. Also, similarly, if it's a patient who's been on, and now we're more than six months, and that's a very, again, arbitrary number, but right. understanding that that PD-1 agent is likely engaged for at least about six months after, and that's based on control blood work uh, from patients with melanoma, then I would say maybe if it's after six months, they're starting to progress, I would be challenged with oh. Given the moving immunotherapy in adjuvant settings, we saw that with Kino 564 or periop space for almost all the disease sites. We've seen that with NAGRA trial coming our way in bladder cancer. We do this for breast cancer and lung cancer. This is an ongoing issue. It's not black and white. There's a lot of gray area here. Go ahead, if I have your permission now, can we focus on de nouveau RCC? as a good portion of our patients will have de novo metastatic disease. Katie, you're keeping paradigm here. Yeah, so, you know, a couple of years ago, the NCCN guidelines started to change how would you choose your frontline regimen that was based on IMDC categorization. Now, I'll actually bring it back full circle and say, now I feel like um, in the last year, given updated data from P1 CTLA-4, Nevo. I still use IMDC to give a prognostication to the patient, but I don't necessarily choose my um, frontline regimen based on IMDC alone. My algorithm is I'll go through and say, okay, well, what is the characteristics of this patient? And I, I do still use IMDC so that if a patient looks like they have poor risk disease, multiple risk factors that pretend to poor biology, is informative to me and helps me advise the patient on prognostication. What it comes down to for me is, is this patient in some type of visceral crisis or such a high burden of disease and pain, for example, from bony meds, that I really don't um, have an opportunity to rescue with a TKI in the second line space. And so, if that's the case, then I will absolutely choose from one of the three great IOTKI regimens that are approved in frontline. Um, 40 to 50% of my patients, de novo metastatic disease, they're often presenting because they have pain from their cancer. And so I think that's probably the percentage of patients that I would be treating with an IOTKI. And then for the other, I will um, I would like the data that came about just in the last year, which was the eight-year survival data. And what it showed us and what was maybe new this year, besides just continued durability from that PD-1 and CTLA-4 agent, for the first time in this data, the intention to treat population had been the intermediate and poor risk. They allowed all patients to enroll on trial. So in this year's data, they did show that, there, again, there's a subset of patients with good risk IMDC criteria, kidney cancer patients who had a durable benefit. And often those are the patients who are not needing a response, maybe patients with small lung nodules who you've been observing for a while, and you have that opportunity to try a PD-1 and CTLA-4 agent. If you unfortunately don't get benefit, you would still have time to proceed with sequential CKI. So um, that's that's why I say I kind of feel like it's come full circle while we were, you know, initially stratifying our treatments really based on IMDC. Um, now I feel like we need a biomarker, but right now I'm using patient symptoms to help drive my first life. 
Thanks for covering that, Katie. Lot to unpack here, where we have, as you stated, dual checkpoint inhibitor approved, along with TKI single agent, also uh, immunotherapy with TKI. Though the reliance on single agent TKI is rather low here, we tend to use dual checkpoint or IO plus TKI. Now, as you stated, for bone or particularly liver, is there one particular one that you rely on? IO plus TKI? Yeah, these uh, trials have shown updated data, Checkmate 9 ER being the Nevo plus Cabo data that was shown updated just um, a few weeks ago and continues to show that benefit even in these hard to treat areas like bone and liver. And I think similarly, we have seen that from the CLEAR trial, which was the pibrolizumab and lenvatinib treatments. So those are the more broader TKIs compared to Exitinib, which is really a pure VEGF targeted. If we're looking at those um, treatment areas for patients, I often will go either to Cabonevo or Pimbrolinda. Katie, can I push a little more on the same idea? Out in the community, would you prefer us uh, sticking with one combination of TKI and IO or be more fluid saying in this particular scenario, be it more bone max, I tend to share with this or liver disease or early disease what is your go-to preferred agent? I think it depends on what you're comfortable with. Ultimately, the most efficacious drug in the patient that you're comfortable managing, that your team has experience with, that's going to be your best chance for success. We've seen multiple times, even in the last year, that treatment dosage matters. And so I think if you're comfortably because and I have so much respect, and I, I want to say that here. I love being a subspecialist and treating just my GU patients. Even in GU, I find it so challenging to keep up with everything. So, so much respect for you all who are having to treat so many different diseases, so many different approvals. And that's why I say be comfortable, have the one that you like, and get in that most efficacious drug dose does matter, starting out at the drug trial started at, and then being able to help either do a dose hold or a dose reduction as necessary gives them the best chance. Yeah, and again, Katie, you also brought up the dosing, which is different when we're using single agent versus when we're using combinations. We have to keep that in mind. We took some side effects. I promise we'll come back to the side effects and some clinical pearls around TKIs and even our second and third line available options. Before that, if the disease was then we have data from TNIVO2, we have other TKIs available, we have Belsudafan. Katie, how are you sequencing these agents? And what data do you have here? Yeah, so I really wanna hit and highlight on, we now have two large randomized phase threes that has shown that if a patient is progressing just off of or recently from a checkpoint inhibitor, that there's no benefit in continuing a checkpoint inhibitor. You know, I think we all want that be the case because we know that's really the only chance for a durable benefit. For the most part, we just saw increased toxicity, increased side effects. If a patient's progressing on that frontline treatment, then I do sequence KIs. And then my choice of sequencing uh, KIs and, and Belzutafan, it's a little bit, um, I think we don't have the a right answer. We don't have a sequencing trial to know for sure. Often it's dependent on what you've done in the frontline settings. If you've done a Nevo Cabo or a Pembro Limba, then I frequently will just reverse and do the opposite in that second line setting. We know, of course, Belzutafan and Tavazna, both great agents, been approved in the third and fourth line setting. Both are either in trials or have just come, so we see data being used earlier in lines of therapy. So I think it's possible that Belzutafan will start to, to move earlier. And I know that we've seen some data for Bosnib from Tinevo showed its benefit showing a median PFS in the light thing around nine months. So again, I think it's what are you comfortable with? What did you use in the frontline setting? Belzutafan is a newer agent on the market. So if I have just a second, I might touch on that great because it's a different side effect profile and gives patients a break from um, hypertension, diarrhea syndrome, all these things that they deal with sequencing through TKIs. The couple pearls that I have having several patients on the Belzutafan trials and now in student practice is monitor closely for that anemia that's an on-target side effect when you block HIF, you block EPO, and it can happen pretty quickly. So I bring them back in every couple weeks in the first several months recommendations are to hold or do a dose reduction as needed for anemia. I even consider using EPO as well. Okay. 
cause. And then the other pearl that I'll mention is it can result in hypoxia. The percentage they saw in clinical trials was quite low, but with my patients, both on trial and in standard practice, is it can sneak up on them. I told my patients to take an oximeter and monitor it daily because we can catch it earlier. That way it typically is it's not like it just happens overnight. It's kind of a slow progression. But if they're waiting three weeks or four weeks in between clinic visits, you'd rather catch them earlier than them becoming in Is that also dose dependent, uh, the hypoxia issue here? Um, so yes, we've um, I've had some attempts. You hold the drug, you get resolution of the hypoxia, you send them home with supplemental oxygen, and this side effect resolves. I have been able to dose reduce and not cause the hypoxia. I've, I've also had the opposite happen where we've dose reduced mm -hmm. and still the hypoxia has returned. I think it is just that kind of close monitoring and we still don't really quite understand. There's some hypothesis that it's the effect on the carotid body or multiple comorbidities, COPD and sleep apnea, but I, I don't think we quite understand who are the individuals who get hypoxia. Thanks for covering that, Katie. With regards to Bazoon fan, important clinical pearls, but with regards to Bazoon, any insights that you might have there? The first insight is that from TNEVO2 and the combination arm, they used a lower dose due to some concerns by the regulatory agent versus the full dose. We saw that the full dose, um, patients treated on full dose had the better PFS and really no differences in quality of life metrics or AE profile. My first pearl is I would start at the full dose and then down as needed. It's a three week on, one week off regimen, similar to prior Sutin, the benefit in that week off of some of the side effects improving. I think just the typical TKI monitoring hypertension, we'll see with that pure VEGF effect, probably the main thing that I see. And again, Roy, you had brought up that we're using epinevo and melanoma, lung cancer. TKI is another thing, not tevazinib. We've used LAN, CABO, and so many other things, be it HCC, of course, here as well. Okay, I know Roy's eyeing the clock. Last question before we close. Katie, any role of NGS in RCC outside of clinical trials? No, right, right now, I think what NGS can do is give you a sense of the aggressiveness of the disease, but there's no actionable mutations that we typically see. If you did NGS and saw a VHL only, you would say this is maybe a slower growing, or if you saw a VHL and a BAP1 mutation, you'd say this is a more aggressive disease. But again, unfortunately, currently they're not actionable, and I'll, I want to emphasize Belzutafan does not require any testing because 90% of patients have a VHL alteration, even if it's not an NGS mutation that can be found. They have some type of hypermethylation or something else disrupting that VHL pathway. I get a lot of questions about that. You know, do we need to have testing or VHL, NGS? And the answer is no. It's just so commonly altered um, in clear cell biology that we would just be able to use it without a biomarker. Um, in non-clear cell, we think because it's not driven by a VHL uh, pathway, uh, we don't typically rely on those in, in those non-clear cell uh, situations. Perfect. Hot topic, CCDNA, PDL one and NGS. No role of that particularly in kidney space. Though, as you stated, Katie, one could use NGS for seeing the prognosis aspect, which is tied to VHL. Thank you. Thanks so much for breaking this down for all of us and covering the current treatment paradigm for RCC. For our listeners, let us go on a quick recap from today. Today, with Dr. Katie Beckerman from Tennessee Oncology, we have covered RCC from top to bottom. In early stage, pembrolizumab is currently approved in adjuvant setting based off of oral survival benefit in Keynote 564 study. In metastatic space, we have options of Ipinevo multiple TKIs with immunotherapy or TKIs alone. Oh, what would you want to add here? Yeah, after first-line treatment, if the disease was to progress, we discussed sequencing TKIs that are not used up front. We also talked about Balsudafan for refractory disease, but it is crucial to keep in mind its potential side effects. Anemia and shortness of breath are associated with Balsudafan, so that should be on your radar. If you've enjoyed this discussion, be sure to check out our other episodes and algorithm series covering bladder cancer, prostate cancer, and breast cancer. Our goal is always to support you in the community, so we would love to hear from you. 
leave us a review to let us know how this is helping you and how we can continue to do better. Together, let's bridge the gap between academia and community so that all our patients get the best care close to home. We are the Oncology Brothers.